Donald Trump as being the last gasp of patriarchal, fossil fuel driven, uh, emperor's new clothes capitalism? Or do we look at Donald Trump as being the beginning of the beginning of the end? I don't know. I always tend to be a really optimistic person. And I, and I used to do a lot of work um, with people on building projects and working in woods and stuff. And I remember a friend of mine saying that when you're working with a chainsaw and you're cutting trees, <laughs> that, it, that it's the moment that when you're working with a chainsaw and it runs out of petrol, just before it runs out of petrol, it has a final big rev. There you have this big, this big surge of energy before it runs out of energy. And I like to imagine Donald Trump as being that. Or as a journalist here said, the comedian, I think it was, said, Donald Trump is like the, is like the noise that the dinosaurs made when they saw the meteorite, the, the meteor falling towards the asteroid, falling towards the Earth. <laughs> like, oh, shit! Welcome to Fringe FM, the podcast that explores the edges of human understanding and looks at the technologies, trends, and societal norms shaping our collective future. Here, the world's top minds share their insights and predictions on the convergence, direction, and ethics of exponential technologies transforming life as we know it. You can learn more and stay up to date at fringe.fm. I've always been incredibly passionate about climate change, but not really sure how to help. Today, we've got an incredible expert on, Rob Hopkins. He's the founder of Transition Network, an organization that's focused on transforming the communities around the world, creating local movements that are driven towards sustainability, success, and economic prosperity for everyone involved. They have some incredible success stories with thousands of cities in their network across the world. He's also the author of several books, including The Power of Just Doing Stuff, The Transition Handbook, and The Transition Companion. He was featured on TED and several TEDx presentations where he talked about the end of big oil. And today we're going to talk about how local communities are reshaping the world and the economy, the exciting new advances in renewable energies, and how we're combating climate change, how and why we need to address those issues and what politicians can do, why governments of the future are evolving, and why Rob's optimistic about the future and where we're headed. I give you Rob Hopkins. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. So Rob, I found you through a TED Talk and have been diving deep into your work. And I'm pretty excited about the, the changes happening in the local communities and economy. I wanted to dive right into that because that's what you've been focused on, it seems like, with Transition Network. Talk to me about where you see the future headed. Well, I guess the, the kind of initial what-if question that started us off on Transition was, what if the, the solutions to the big challenges that we face, particularly around climate change, around economic insecurity, around energy insecurity, social fragmentation what if the solutions to those came from the bottom up rather than the top down and what if we were able to look at that process of making the places where we live more resilient in terms of energy in terms of food and by resilient i mean able to adapt to and withstand shock what if we were able to look at that process as being a historic opportunity to rethink how we do things at the local level because as naomi klein says the beautiful thing about climate change is the only solutions left are the radical ones so there's, there's a huge kind of liberation in that and freedom and opening up of the imagination and opening up possibility. So transition really started along that line. We, we always say in a lot of our things, you know, if I try to do this on my own, it'll be too little. If we wait for the governments, it'll be too late. But if we get the people around us together, and if enough other people are doing the same thing in enough other places, then it might just be enough and it might just be in time. So fundamental to our, our approach is that there's a huge amount that we can do locally in the places where we live. And <clears throat> when we look at a challenge like climate change, when you look at the whole thing, it's so massive and existential that it feels like you can't do anything. But if you can break it down into the things that you can do locally, actually there's a lot that you can do. And there's communities you can actually move a lot faster than if you try and change policy at the top level. So transition has become uh, what we call is now a movement of communities reimagining and rebuilding the world. And what it looks like on the ground is a different way of thinking about what economic development is because it's about trying to remodel the economy so as much money as possible stays locally, cycles locally, and we build that kind of local economy that is more flexible, more adaptable, is owned by local people, is more responsive to their needs than the current kind of globalized model. That triggers a million different questions and directions. <laughs> it usually does. It usually does. But uh, how did you get into this? So what's the story? Why did you become p passionate about climate change? There's got to be some type of 
long rabbit hole here? Well, uh, uh, I guess I, for me, I always trace it back to punk, actually, in that uh, for me, when I was about 14, punk was a, was a huge influence, and particularly that whole kind of do-it-yourself culture. If you don't like the music, make your own band. If you don't like the music press, make your own fanzines. And there was a lovely thing at the time that was a, a diagram of how to play three chords, and it said, here are three chords, now form a band. And I think that kind of approach to, uh, to politics and to change making has always really kind of inspired me. And when I was about 22, I, did a, I studied permaculture, which, was a, which kind of rewired my brain really as a sort of a, a sustainable uh, a toolkit for sustainable design. It's a, it's a brilliant sort of a thing, which really gets you looking at possibilities in different places. And so then for many years, I was a teacher of permaculture, a teacher of natural building, straw bear building, earth building that kind of stuff. I set up a two-year course that was teaching that. So I'm, I'm very kind of rooted in that, in that world of practical, positive solutions-focused responses that aren't about waiting for anyone's permission, but that are just about, okay, these are the resources that we have. This is what we've got. What are we going to do with it? Let's bring some smart thinking to that. Let's bring a really clear invitation. Let's bring a sense that what we do here together has the potential to change history that what we're doing here isn't a kind of top-down uh, tick list of, of things, but it's an organic sort of a, uh, like a culture change process where you're inoculating the place with, with change and then just seeing where it goes. So for me, I guess that's, that's where I've always come from, is I love to see things that self-organize, things that offer uh, a different story, and things that make a real difference. Self-organize, that's what we do here at Fringe FM. We get the world's smartest, thought leaders and creators on so that we can talk about and create a better future together. If you know someone who should be included, Matt at Fringe.fm, or you can hit me on Twitter at It's Matt Ward. We'd love to have incredible people on. And if you want to contribute in other ways, that's always great. Reach out. And if you love the show, you can help us create great new things. Now let's jump back to it. It sounds like all of the exact antitheses of big government. So are we going into an era where we change that and we change how community, society and humanity structure? I think it's, I think it's already happening. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I'm in a position where I look at all that stuff all the time. So, you know, if you're me, yeah, that's absolutely what's happening. And it's changing and the pace is really accelerating. If you just stay inside and watch Fox News all day, then it doesn't really look like very much is happening. But actually, there's, for me, there's a phenomenal, you know, there, there are lots of places that I look to for, for hope around this. You know, I'm one of the people who started a craft brewery here in my town because I'm, for me, the whole craft beer explosion has been one of the really interesting examples of this, actually. You know, that, that idea that you've had this flourishing of enterprises that are based in a place uh, that are exploring local ingredients that are often owned by local people that are rooted in that place and are really driving the economic regeneration of that place. We see the same thing with food now, you know, massive explosion of, of, uh, of, of really good food. And, uh, uh, and an increasing sort of focus on local food. We had a big story here. I'm sure you've, you've heard of Jamie Oliver, the, the kind of TV chef guy over here who did all the campaigning around school dinners and things. And uh, he has a big sort of chain of restaurants around the world, which is, he's having to, which is in terrible trouble. A lot of those big restaurant chains are, are, are unraveling because we're seeing this big explosion of local independent places that are telling a better story, that are serving their community better, so I think when you go looking for the signs, you know, we see in, in some countries now where there's, where there's a big push, big push for renewable energy. And a lot of that energy is increasingly owned by communities, uh, the, by, by the people who benefit from it. We're seeing regional banks starting to make a return. We're seeing an explosion of local currencies across Europe, money that is designed specifically to remain within that local community, that local economy, and, and tell a story of that local economy. And for me, I always think, I think this is really what the economic story of the 21st century is going to be is going to be how can we uh, how how can we make our local economies like a, there's an analogy that the new economics foundation use where they say think of the economy of the place where you live as being like a leaky bucket a bucket full of holes and at the moment money comes into that from wages grants uh, government you know, pensions whatever comes into the bucket and then most of it leaves straight away it goes out through the supermarket holes the shopping on amazon holes the buying uh, cause beer uh, holes, all of these sorts of things. But when you change your way of looking at that, every hole in that bucket is a potential new business, new livelihood, new training opportunity for young people, 
new investment opportunity for local people to move their money out of the banks and move it into something which is going to transform the economy of that place. And I'll just share a little, a little story because you might think, well, this all sounds very sort of theoretical and nice, and, but it's not, never actually going to happen. I was in Belgium a few weeks ago and Be- transition is just on fire across Belgium. And there's a city called Liège, which is a former industrial city. And I went there about four years ago when Liège en transition had just started. And I went and did some talks and met with the group and things. And, uh, and I went to an event where they launched a project that was called Centur Alimentaire, which means food belt. And it was all designed around uh, a what if question. And the what if question was, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food consumed in this city was grown around the edge of this city? And so they invited everybody who, who had any kind of interest in food. So academics, chefs, uh, farmers, uh, shop owners, everybody, academics, researchers, whatever. And, and they had this big event. Anyway, four years later, I go back to Liège. In that time, they started 14 new cooperatives. They have a farm, they have two vineyards, a brewery, a pedal-powered cycle delivery business, two retail shops in the city. They've raised 5 million euros in investment from local people in the city. I met the mayor of the city who said, yeah, eight years ago, we wanted to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. And we own a whole load of land around the city, and we're making it all available to Centur Alimentaire to rent at low rents to young people who want to get into farming and, and grow food. They have a local currency that runs through the whole thing and kind of weaves the whole thing together. And I talked to the guy, Pascal, who is the manager of one of these shops. So they have these two big, they took over a big unit, painted it white, very simple, put the food out in boxes, telling the story of the farmer, where it comes from. Uh, they always pay the farmer what they want and their prices are 15% less than, than the supermarket. I said, um, I said, you know, what's your ambition with this? He said, well, at the moment we have two shops. We started with one. Uh, already it, within three months it was outperforming our best case scenario now we've opened two by the time we've opened 10 he said uh, he said and then using a word that's a french word that doesn't translate into english perfectly but it really works he said when we open 10 shops the supermarkets will start to fragilize and they they had that kind of vision to say you know th- this is going to be in 10 15 20 years time this is going to be the new economy in this city and they were doing it you know, so this is something, and you, you know, you can tell stories like that all day from all around the world. This is this is underway now. So let me ask you: as we seem to be moving towards an increasingly international and an increasingly local world, that creates some dynamic tensions. So we have a lot of isolationist groups around the U.S., Europe. We had Brexit. A lot of these things. I personally think farming closer to where you live is a dead obvious use case, but it does create some of those also us and them mentalities. How do, you, how do you deal with that? And how do you see humanity evolving and potentially thriving in the next century? Hey, if we didn't have your attention already, we will now. This is ridiculous what Rob's about to say. I can't believe that this is happening. And this is something that we all need to think about and try to solve. I love the uh, Herman Daly, the economist, had a, a saying that I used to really love. He said, you know, we, because at, at the moment, Britain exports as many potatoes to Germany as it imports from Germany. And we send the same amount of butter to the Netherlands as we import from the Netherlands. And we export the same amount of scarves to Canada as we import from Canada. And uh, Herman Daly used to say, well, why don't we just email each other the recipes? You know, for me, there is something where you could imagine a version of something like transition or localization, which is rooted in that idea of putting up borders, putting up fences, closing out, you know, there are some terrible, like North Korea or something, you know, but actually, I think actually what you're seeing in transition is, is completely the opposite of that. But in, the, in that actually, if we are to successfully manage the transition to a world that manages to stay below one and a half degrees in terms of climate change, then it makes absolutely no sense to be ex- importing potatoes from Germany when we can perfectly well grow potatoes here. That doesn't mean that we put up, there's a difference between kind of economic globalization, I think, and, and a cultural globalization. Economic globalization, um, only makes sense when you have an enormous amount of uh, surplus cheap energy in order to make that happen. And that's something that we don't really have anymore. We no longer have the carbon budget to really make it uh, sensible to be transporting things all over the place, because actually that process of bringing that production closer to the place where we live has such possibility for unlocking creativity. You know, when I go to France, I don't want to walk around a city and see all the same shops and cafes that I have at home. I want to go to walk around markets where there are 
uh, wines and beers and cheeses and breads that, that are of that place that, you, that, that actually I can't get anywhere else. And this kind of globalized sort of uh, everywhere the same mentality leads to a blanding out of diversity, a huge loss of diversity, and I think a, a, a sort of a narrowing down of our imagination. But that's a very different thing, I think, from saying we don't want cultural globalization. So for me, one of the things about transition that is most powerful is if, I was, if it was just us here in my little town in Devon doing transition and no one else was, then we really might as well not bother. The beauty of it now is that there are thousands of communities in 50 countries around the world who are, share, who are doing this and sharing their stories with each other. Their successes, their failures, they have uh, um, like a, a network of those national, we call them national hubs, national transition organizations who are sharing all of their learnings too. Then I think you have a, you have a, a cultural exchange, an international network of, of communities and economies that are going through that process of making themselves more resilient, but then sharing. And you mentioned Brexit. And actually, for me, it's very much the opposite of Brexit, because Brexit tried to portray itself as being sort of <clears throat> take back control and giving power back to local communities. In reality, it's nothing of the sort. It's a kind of neoliberalist dream of shutting out worker protection, basically kind of prostituting our economy to the rest of the world, to whoever wants to buy it, throwing away worker protection, environmental protection, and handing power to the wealthiest, most powerful elites, making this country one of the most attractive tax havens in the world, which is totally not what we want to do in transition. It used that language of take back control. And actually, in reality, what it meant was it was gave the very wealthy elites in this country the power to take back control from the people who were actually putting in place legislation to protect workers and ordinary people in this country. So for me, it's a completely different thing than what we're talking about in transition. And transition is, it's very counter, it's very revolutionary to how the world's running today. Have you seen challenges with local governments? So this is sort of going back to an era where we had stronger feudal lords and self-sufficient villages, townships, et cetera, where people didn't have to rely as much on external sources and the governments were weaker. Have you seen challenges? And what are your thoughts on that and then the implications? You know, when we, when we started doing transition, there was a whole... In, in the first book we did, I, I, I put in a thing that was called the seven buts, which were the seven things that people would say. Oh, yes, well, transition, and that, transition sounds like a very nice idea, but, you know. So there were things like, but uh, we haven't got any money, or but no one else cares, or things like that. And one of them was, uh, but they will try and stop it. You know, this sort of the, the kind of powerful organizations and people would, would recognize transition as being a uh, profound challenge to what they were doing and would somehow try and interfere with it and stop it. And, you know, I can honestly say after 12 years, that really hasn't happened. And I think that that is partly because we have designed it in such a way that it's not confrontational. Transition, you could think of transition as being like a, a piece of social technology that is designed to, to, to work at the local scale. So a lot of it is about how do you, how do you communicate it in such a way that it, it is, it's not aligned with any particular part, political party. It's, it tries to remain open and accessible to as many people as possible with the minimum of barriers for people getting involved. So, you know, for example, when here in Totnes, we started Totnes Pound as a local currency, just kind of as an experiment, really, to see what would happen. And it inspired the, the city of Bristol. You know, a few other places did it, but they were quite small and they were a bit below the radar. And when, um, when the city of Bristol, which is like half a million people, announced that it was going to launch the Bristol Pound, the Bank of England rang them up and said, I think you need to come in and have a little chat. So they went up and talked to them for about three hours. And actually, the Bank of England then published a position paper of their understanding of the legality of local currencies. And then they've just sort of carried on, really. I, you know, I, it's hard to think of anything that we've tried to do that there has been a kind of a very clear kickback against you know that there, there seems to be actually quite the opposite in, in many cases what transition brings to what ex, what is exciting about transition for local governments for mayors uh, for people like that is that it is a what it is it, it shows that it is possible to bring people together to want to do good things and to change things and that people will get involved and people will make that happen and for many people uh, in government in local government they're really excited about it. That was kind of why they came into it in the first place. So they get very excited about it. And, you know, I meet with mayors who will say, you know, I love transition, but we don't have any transition groups in my city. How do we get them started? So for me, that idea that somehow uh, transition will tread on lots of people's toes 
people will try and shut it down. At, at its best, like when I was talking about Liège in the city of Liège, the mayor was so excited about it. He was like, this, this, is, this is our story now. And, and it's so wonderful. This has brought people together. The citizens have come together and have created this and it's becoming the new story of this city. And he was so excited about it rather than thinking, shit, how do I shut this down? <laughs> Actually, he was really excited about what it then made possible for his city. I'd love to hear your thoughts on cryptocurrencies and blockchain because the decentralized organization structure is very similar to what I'm hearing with transition. Yeah, well, I, I, have, to, I have to kind of preface answering this by saying I, I don't really understand blockchain that well. It feels to me like, um, you know, I, uh, I, I'm very troubled about the kind of energy implicated, the amount of energy that cryptocurrencies use. I read a study the other day that said that by next year, the equivalent of all the electricity being generated by all the solar energy that has been installed around the world will be needed to drive cryptocurrencies. And I just don't really see the point of it. It seems like pretty kind of making something, I I don't really see it. It feels like I'm I'm increasingly sort of drawn to to the tangible and the analog and the real. And cryptocurrencies feel like something where a bit of a pyramid scheme. The people who got in first are going to make a lot of money out of it. I mean, I'm sure there are uses for, for blockchain. I know a lot of people in terms of uh, renewable energy are getting quite interested in some of the implications of it. But it feels to me like actually the, the drive should be how do we bring this stuff closer to home and closer to being t- to tangible stuff rather than making it more and more esoteric and abstract. And I, th- and I think, the, as I said before, the energy implications of blockchain and really uh, of cryptocurrencies are really troubling. So for the energy, that's specifically Bitcoin mining. There are a lot of different attempts to, essentially the idea is to secure the network. There are a lot of different systems designed for securing the network that don't require the energy. The reason why I brought it up and asked is it's very interesting because you do see these projects internationally of people self-organizing to try to create something, whether that's a decentralized version of Uber, that's a Facebook that's not spying on you. Then they have decentralized autonomous organizations, at least that's what they're working on creating. And it sounds very similar to very similar to transition where you have a group of people working towards a collective goal and benefiting. Yeah, sure. I mean, they, uh, and there are many, uh, many great things like that. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I do some, whenever I sit down with, particularly with young people, but, but it seems to be increasingly across the board now. And you, you start thinking about, you know, what, what might be the inventions or the, the things that we're going to need to successfully get through the next 10, 20, 30 years, you know, and, and it always tends to resort to apps and digital Plat- new platforms and uh, you know and i'm sure there are there are many of those things that are very useful and that will be a part of that but actually i'm i'm just as interested in the kind of social things that we're going to need and the the models that we're going to need for for how we organize the ways in which we are able to kind of provoke the communities where we live with sort of uh, actions or projects that, that that are able to start shifting people's thinking now, most of what we do in transition is is very real. It's creating new markets. It's uh, looking at bringing land into community ownership so that the community can become its own developer and build housing that meets community needs. It's about installing renewable energy in such a way that local people can invest in it. Finding other models whereby people can invest their money into projects that are happening at the local scale. It's bringing. It's opening the first new mill in the town for over a hundred years. And then finding markets for that flower among local businesses, you know, those sort of things I think are as important as looking for new sort of uh, apps and technological breakthroughs. But actually, we kind of live in a time and a culture where those digital ones are always the sexier ones and tend to get the more energy and focus put into them. And we then get distracted, I think, often from doing that very real work of saying, okay, that old factory is closed. What are we going to do with that? How can we, as a community, become the uh, the body that owns that place? runs it on behalf of this community and uh, but often i think we get sort of we we drift off into kind of digital dreams and, and and we and our feet lift off the off the ground of the very real work that needs to be done right now hey matt here i want to point out that this is incredibly important it's not something we should write off just because your views are different this is something where the more people that are focused on building better future the better regardless of how they do it i know a certain people that are listening to the show probably have different ideas. Specifically on the blockchain side, if you guys are involved with building blockchain-based startups, you're interested in building decentralized autonomous organizations and trying to build the governance structures of the future, I would recommend reaching out to Rob. He's got a ton of experience that's directly related in a tangential field that I think could be very valuable for whoever tries to build out the systems of the future. How do you organize those communities? What's the best way? 
Well, I think the, the, the way that we always try and do transition is not to set out to organize the community. We set out to try and, uh, uh, and inspire the community with, with story and possibilities. And then we put in place the infrastructure, the support that they will need to then, uh, to then go off and do it. So, so when we started doing transition here, for example, we started transition time. The idea of transition time to Ness was, here was a charity which could apply for grants, which had a bank account, which had an email list and a website. So if you had an idea for a project that you wanted to do, you didn't need to start all that stuff. You could affiliate with the project and we would give you support and, uh, and enable you to do that. So about 50 different projects now have come through Transition Town Totness and they get support with fundraising. They get space on the website. They feel part of that kind of an umbrella. Um, so that's kind of worked better for us. You know, we don't go in, Transition doesn't work like a Coca-Cola franchise, set of things you have to do. We really trust a lot to that idea of, um, of self-organization, and, uh, and it really works. For self-organization, it's very interesting as we move towards the future of increasing autonomy and increasing AI, taking away potentially jobs. What do you see as the role for local communities in terms of support structures and how we can best cope and prepare for what's coming? Well, I mean, I, you know, there are certainly things in the bigger picture. I think the, the whole idea of universal basic income is very interesting. In terms of uh, in terms of enabling that, you know, I, I do find myself really troubled around a lot of the AI stuff and this this kind of the power that resides in Silicon Valley to decide basically what happens next. And yeah, we're all going to have driverless cars. Well, I don't remember anybody ever saying let's have driverless cars, and all of a sudden we're being told we're going to have driverless cars. And you know, I'm I'm researching a book at the moment about imagination and uh, reading a lot of the a lot of the research around. The impact that, you know, if, if you look at the last 20 years since everything went online and social media and so on and so on, and the impact that a lot of those technologies are having, particularly on our attention spans, on our ability to concentrate, on increasing levels of, of depression, mental health and so on. You know, I think there is a real risk associated with a lot of AI stuff. It's, it's not the, the kind of vision of, it's certainly not my vision of things, you know. But if, if we accept that actually, well, that's what's happening and there's not much we can do about it then we're going to have a lot of people with time on their hands and we have a lot of communities where there is an enormous amount to do. I think in the 1930s in the US with the Depression, there was the Land Corps, which was set up uh, to give people things to do, who actually planted, I can't remember the name, like millions and millions of trees and prevented soil erosion and did incredible kind of work. Well, if we have this tiny, tiny window of opportunity to, for the world to stay below one and a half degrees, which already in climate terms is really not great. And we're already seeing the impacts of being at about one, 1 1.2 degrees now all over the world. If we're going to stay below one and a half degrees, that is a phenomenal collective push. So if it's true that AI is coming in, then maybe we should be looking at saying, well, therefore we've got a lot of people with some time. That needs to be the focus. What would it look like? What would a land core for the 2020s look like? with that as its kind of, uh, as its mission. How would you inspire leaders to think about that? So I know with transition, you're very much focused on local communities, but to be able to have something where if we have a worldwide challenge of 1.5 degrees Celsius, how do we get more people on board with that? Especially when Trump is claiming it's all a joke. <laughs> yeah. The irony of that, of course, though, is that actually Trump knows it's not a joke and that all of Trump's golf courses all around the world have climate mitigation plans. Uh, based on a full understanding of what's going on. Uh, I think that we know, so, so what we're seeing after 12 years of this kind of transition experiment is, is there are places where people in community come together and run to become their local government. You know, you see a whole movement now of, of, of people gathering together as independents so they don't run under a party political banner. They run as themselves around a very clear platform of what they want to do for the community and they then become the local government. You know, we see in some places where we have, uh, particularly in France and Belgium, where you have mayors who are being elected, who are very inspired by transition. And that's a very kind of clear part of, of what it is they want to do. I think a lot of what we try to do is to tell stories and to try and tell those stories in a way that they really intrigue and inspire people uh, politically. There's the wonderful thing in Cleveland, in Ohio, the Evergreen Co-op, who are a huge inspiration, which is the, uh, in Cleveland where they where the hospital decided that rather than letting its energy, food and laundry services just be run by some faceless corporation, they were going to set up a cooperative to do each of those things. And the benefits to the community and to the local economy have been huge. And it's been a real inspiration. So 
you're now in the UK starting to see cities like Preston, for example, who have done a whole mapping thing for the city to say, where does all of our money go? You know, they brought together the seven main public organizations who spend taxpayers' money, so the universities, the, the fire brigade, the police, the, the, the municipality, whatever, and said, together we spend £750 million a year. Where does it go? And no one knew. And when they found out that only 4% of that money was actually spent into the economy of Preston, they were really horrified. And that's now led to them changing how they, how they do their economics so that it's all about how do we make money stay locally? Let's bring our pension funds back to this city, use it to build affordable housing. Let's change how we do tendering for public contracts so that it's not just big corporations who can apply, but it's also, we break it down into bits so a lot more local companies can apply. That model, what they're doing in Preston, is now inspiring political parties here to change their policies around making that uh, what they want to do. So for me, there's a whole thing about, well, we can lobby, we can put pressure, but actually what I see as, as, as being just as effective is we tell the stories. We tell the stories of what's already happening. We try and get those stories more so that more people hear them. We try and take any sort of party political thing out of it because actually a, a story like what's happening in Preston really should appeal just as much to people on the left as to people on the right. So, so, so that's, that's kind of it for me, that there is nothing, there is no substitute for not waiting for permission and just getting on with it and just getting started. And I always say to groups that I go to visit who are doing transition, you have no idea when you start this stuff whether to, and you will start a project. And even if it's a small, uh, you've built a garden in your street, for example, and you might be thinking, well, that, well that's not going to change anything. You really have no idea where it's going to go, who's going to see it, who's going to be inspired by it. And that, guys, is the butterfly effect, the entire purpose of Fringe FM, to put out those stories of people changing the world and inspire others to do the same. Now let's jump back to it. And it's the stories that become really kind of sticky. Uh, there's, a, there's an amazing place in France called Ungersheim, where they have a mayor called Jean-Claude Mensch, who, who was very inspired by transition and who started, uh, who they, they're, they're kind of a transition village. And they started 21 really phenomenal, amazing projects. That story is now, someone's made a film about it. It's being shown all over France. You know, just get on with it. And the stories will have a life of their own that you really can't predict. I really think you should do some more research into blockchain. I think you could find a lot of advocates who will be very supportive of what you're doing. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, yeah. I need someone to sit down and explain it to me. I'll see if I can find some good podcast episodes to shoot over to you. But this is essentially the vision. And it's, it's more millennials doing it in a millennial way. But the exact same vision of taking back, uh, taking back control and power. What's, um, what's the state of the industry look like in terms of climate change, solar energy, renewables? Where are we at right now? Where are we headed? We are way ahead, I think, of what, anybody, of, of what people predicted, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. You know, we're now, uh, solar in the UK is now at the stage where we, we're now having days where, where there is no coal burnt and that we ha- we're having sort of fossil fuel free days here in the UK now. And because of wind, because of solar. And in Germany, there are days when they've got so much energy, they're just sort of giving it away because of renewables. You know, for me, one of the things that's really important, though, is that when we look at renewable energy, that where possible, we, we make sure that as much of it as possible com- is in community ownership. Because, you know, we had, up until about five years ago here, we had a, a really strong emerging community renewables movement which was aided by really good feed-in tariffs. So communities all over the country were setting up these great models where people could not invest in the bank, but invest in in solar at the community scale, uh, wind at the community scale, which helped them then to design some sort of financial resilience into what they're doing as as communities. And then the government changed it and sort of took all the wind out of that. So there are some much bigger community projects that are happening. But yeah, so there's a lot more that could be done, but we're still way off where we need to be we're still kind of largely at a sort of aim heading for a three, three and a half degree world rather than a one and a half degree world. Partly because we, we seem to be averse to having the conversation about energy conservation on any kind of realistic scale. And we also have to start to grasp the really thorny question of economic growth because there are many, many advances being made in terms of energy uh, conservation and uh, renewables installed. But that keeps being overtaken all the time by economic growth. And we have to be talking about economic growth and looking beyond that to saying, well, let's have some new measures of how we value what progress is, because economic growth is going to be the thing that finishes us off. Are we entering a post-capitalistic world? That's a kind of glass half full, glass half empty question, I think. You know, 
uh, do do we do we look at Donald Trump as being the last gasp of patriarchal, fossil fuel driven, uh, emperor's new clothes capitalism, or do we look at Donald Trump as being the beginning of the beginning of the end? I don't know. I always tend to be a really optimistic person, and I, and I used to do a lot of work um, with people on building projects and working in woods and stuff. And I remember a friend of mine saying that when you're working with a chainsaw and you're cutting trees, <laughs> that, that, it, that it's the moment that when you're working with a chainsaw and it runs out of petrol, just before it runs out of petrol, it has a final big rev. You, know, you have this big, this big surge of energy before it runs out of energy. And I like to imagine Donald Trump as being that. Or as a journalist here said, the, the, the comedian I think it was said, Donald Trump is like the... It's like the noise that the dinosaurs made when they saw the meteorite, the, the meteor falling towards the asteroid, falling towards the Earth. It was like, oh, shit! You know, that, that's kind of what we're seeing there, really, because you know, coal is dead, fossil fuels are on their way out, climate litigation is, is, is taking off all around the world. You can't cling on to coal, you can't cling on to fossil fuels, you can't cling on to patriarchy and all that sort of stuff now. It's all, all that stuff is just sort of fading away. So, yeah, I think of it, I think that we are we're seeing the last gasp of the dinosaurs before we move inevitably into what comes next. And the beauty of it is, you know, I always, the, the thing that I hate being told the most is, oh, you're a utopian. And actually, when you talk about transition, what you're talking about is utopia. And it's so not, because actually, you know, when we're surrounded by dystopias all the time, the future's going to be terrible, it's going to be awful, the future's going to be this, it's going to be that. Actually, for me, when I think about the future, it's not a utopia. It's really a, you know, William Gibson, the science fiction writer, used to say the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And, you know, I could take you now to go and see a four-story a four story straw bale apartment block in Geneva, 100% composting toilets, harvesting rainwater, beautiful, beautiful place, surrounded by food gardens. I could take you to food gardens in the middle of Berlin, growing masses of food right in the center of the city, to rooftop gardens in New York, to uh, incredible renewable energy places to cities where there's barely any cars you know all of that stuff already exists this is not some utopian fantasy the, and we know that it works the question is how do we scale it up and uh, and that you know so, so when, when i'm trying to when, when i dream about the future i'm just piecing that stuff together that's already here i'm not dreaming about something that is some kind of a fantasy and that's the purpose of this podcast to get people like you that can share those glimpses of the future with people who don't even realize it's happening mm. i was listening to a podcast yesterday and apparently there are hotels in japan where Literally, they are staffed by robots. They're not humans. And that you see this dichotomy between the world as some people see it and the world that we're seeing. It's incredibly important to have these type of conversations so that people can, people can better understand what's happening and how they can change. I want to get your thoughts on Tesla, what Elon's doing, and how other entrepreneurs can, can pile on. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's a lot of what Elon Musk does that I think is wonderful. And his kind of, uh, his imagination, his his sense that anything is possible, uh, his, you know, the, 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 the idea of making solar roof tiles that are cheaper than anything else. I do, you know, I, I, I can see why electric vehicles are really important. I do have a strong part of me that actually feels that we need to be moving away from the dialogue about alternative cars to saying we need alternatives to cars. And if cars are electric or driverless or whatever, it still means we end up with cities that are gridlocked full of cars. So, you know, so how can we uh, how can we move beyond that? I think all of the stuff about let's go to Mars, I kind of, I started to despair a bit when I heard that he was, the amount of money he's demanding in bonuses from Tesla, I kind of get a little, I, I do despair a little bit. But I think fundamentally, he's a, he's a very imaginative person for whom there is no sense of, yeah, we can't do that. And I think that's a really powerful spirit that we need, that we need right now. The gridlock should be at least a bit better with driverless cars, if you have one car for every eight cars today, then you're able to cut a lot of the traffic out. Ideally, that's, uh, that's where we're headed, I'm hoping. Of course, that's all subject to debate regulation and all of that fun stuff, which is yeah. complicated with the deaths. Yeah, I guess, I guess, um, I guess there's something that, uh, that, that actually, for me, there's really interesting research about London taxi drivers, who when they become taxi drivers, they have to learn and memorize the street layout of London. It's called the knowledge, and it takes them quite a while. To, to, to have it but then they have the whole map of london in their heads and then when they do brain scans on them they have a particular part of their brain which is much larger for this sort of knowledge and, and and i do have concerns about when we no longer need to look at maps we no need when we do everything with sat nav and we don't 
uh, have to think about where we are in relation to anything. When we are increasingly sort of passive, we don't need to remember or remember anything anymore because Google remembers it all for us. I fear that we lose something really, really kind of important there. And that actually, when you drive, you have to give your attention to doing that. And that at a time when our attention spans are getting less and less. Hey, Matt here. Quick note. Study out of Canada with 2,000 participants has shown the human attention span has gone from around 12 seconds in 2000 to around 8 seconds in 2015. Now one second less than a goldfish. I think that if we throw away the idea of actually driving something and having to focus and concentrate while we do it, I think there's something there that we lose as well as something that we, that we might gain, actually, is my sense. I would agree if that time is replaced with only Netflix. I think there's other ways that we can, we can fix things where when people have more time, they can do more meaningful pursuits. We can have more so, art so, so, flourishing. So, so, so what do you think people are going to be doing while they're sitting in their driverless cars being ferried? Up? I think it really depends. I think 80% of people are boring and will just watch Netflix. I think 20% will <laughs> focus on improving themselves. That's usually what the, the breakdown's always 80-20 for just about everything in life. So, so, there'll be, so there'll be some people meditating as they travel through. <laughs> and everyone else is just on Instagram. Good yeah, I, I sure hope not. But that's what it looks like if you go through public transit. <laughs> yeah. We are. Uh, we will see. I know we've been running a bit, and you've got quite a bit to go. Uh, quite a bit that you still need to do. I would like some future predictions for you. Ten, fifteen years out, what are some of the big changes you see that you don't think others are noticing? Where are you a contrarian? Where am I a contrarian? Uh, I think that we will see a much more meaningful movement of young people opting out of social media which i think is already starting and um, moving towards more kind of real interaction and real connection with people rob is very right on this one studies are showing that as of the recording three billion people per month are dropping off of facebook turns out cambridge analytica and donald trump are not that popular i think we will see a lot more organizations uh, and individuals starting to move away from air travel you know, this idea of, uh, of everybody flying around the world to go to conferences. You know, the, the, the discussion around, around air travel is just so vital. I, I gave up flying in 2006, and I know many other people who, who are living without flying and finding other ways of doing things. It's such an important conversation. Uh, I think in 10 or 15 years, we will start to see, like, like I talked about in Liège, you know, I think we will start to see the fragmentation of, of supermarkets and, and a real kind of emergence of really strong local alternatives to that i think we'll we'll see the the divestment movement which is currently uh, gaining a lot of energy which is around organizations taking their money out of fossil fuels uh, i think the next step of that is going to be and then what so we'll see this whole thing of regional banks local energy companies new models for people to move their money out of the banks and to move it into organizations uh, who are changing the place where they live i think that will become pretty standard pretty commonplace pretty normal um, I think the idea that when we look at cities, we look at them as being potential intensive edible spaces, you know, whether we're growing food up the walls of buildings, on the roofs of buildings, in buildings, any green, you know, a lot of green space in the city will be put down to that. I think that we will see then that being an urban farmer, an intensive urban market gardener will actually be the hippest uh, career choice among young people. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I could go on and on. There's a few. Those are some pretty solid ones. I can agree with most of those. And the farming will be much easier once we start to get rid of all of this parking in cities. It's a ridiculous amount of space that gets uh, gets yeah, eaten totally. by parking. Totally. It's like you know, if uh, how many acres of land do we put do, do we put down to to cars? And and even the roads. You know, there's that lovely photograph someone took a while ago where you have a street and you you have the number of people if they're all in cars, and then the number of street you need if they're in buses the number of streets if they're all on bicycles. As we move more stuff to public transport, to bicycles, you start to free up, you know, let's, let's take up some of the roads as well and, and grow stuff on those. I lived it for a while in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and that's what you know when it's efficient. It's motorbikes everywhere. There's, there's fossil fuels burning like crazy, but you can see how many more people fit on the road. I completely, mm -hmm. I completely agree. It'll be, a, it'll be a very interesting future. I mm -hmm. have one last critically important question for you. I want a challenge for listeners. What do you want people to look into, do, think about, or take action on? So I would, uh, I would say that if you go to, so if, if you're in the US, have a look at the Transition US website, transitionus.org, and have a look and see if there are transition groups that are already happening near where you live. And there are transition groups in hundreds of places now across the US. So if there are, 
just go along and say hello and see what they're doing and see if they're doing anything that interests you. Uh, if there isn't transition happening, then on the Transition Network website, transitionnetwork.org, we have a really great free guide called uh, The Essential Guide to Doing Transition and another one called 21 Stories of Transition. So the 21 Stories is a thing we did for COP21 in Paris, the Climate Talks, where we went to the, the whole network and said, tell us your stories you want us to share at COP21. And it has some brilliant stories in there. And then the essential guide is just a really clear how to get started where you live. Just do something. Put on a, put on a meal in your street or invite people to see a film or do something that is about taking a step into uh, interacting with the, with the community around you in a different way. And then just, you know, just see what the response is and see how it moves you and, and where you might want to go with it. I think, I think in many ways, you know, we, we have this idea very often that there are people who know nothing about climate change, for example, and don't do anything. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have people who know a lot about it and who, who are doing loads and loads of things. And that somehow for years, there was this belief in the environmental movement that all we needed to do was to give, uh, to give somebody a sufficiently terrifying DVD and they would magically leap from one end to the other. And it doesn't work like that. It's about steps. And what I see again and again is, you know, those small projects, whether it's a, a garden on a street or a, a, a you know, starting you know, a, a, an exchange, a repair cafe or something, you know, that those things are a step in. And then once people are in, they go, hmm, actually, this feels really great. And I know more people and I'm having more fun and I feel more connected. Let's take another step. And then you take steps in like that. So my suggestion would be just take a first step and, and see what happens. Absolutely. It has to be manageable. You put one foot in front of the other. If you're trying to lose 100 pounds and you think about losing 100 pounds, it's probably harder than thinking about losing one. Yeah, exactly. Completely agree. What's, uh, what's one topic you would like to see us cover on the show and who would you like to hear speak about it? So I'm currently researching a book about imagination. And as part of that research, the way that I like to work is that I, I, I like to sort of make all my source material available as I go probably commercially thoroughly reckless but it's just kind of how I work so all the interviews that I've done are all available on a blog that I'm doing called robhopkins.net and uh, one of the best people I interviewed on there is a guy called Sven Burkert who is a I think he lives in Boston and he he's a kind of literary he, he, he writes he's a book reviewer and he publishes a literary journal he wrote a book called Changing the Subject all about attention and the the, the kind of state of health of attention in our society and and what happens to a culture when it stops being able to focus and it loses its ability, to, 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 it loses its attention. And it was, for me, one of the most fascinating interviews that I did uh, during the whole kind of research for the book. So I'd, I'd suggest him. It's incredibly, irrele- it's incredibly relevant in today's attention economy. Thanks, uh, yeah. thanks so much for coming today. This has been a lot of fun, Rob. We'll have links and everything in the show notes. We'll include the TED Talk and all the incredible stuff you've done. But uh, what do you want to leave people with? Where's the best place for them to connect with you on the interweb? So either transitionnetwork.org or uh, robhopkins.net is the blog I'm doing, which is about the, the, uh, the research for this book on imagination. Awesome. This has been fun and uh, imagination inspiring. I think we're moving towards an interesting world. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so. <laughs> I certainly hope so as well. God, boring would suck. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, a, there's a beautiful... Um, uh, actually, can, can, can I just go and grab something and then and then go for it? Just a little quote, but also there was you asked there was the question you were going to ask me about the party, what I'd say at the party. What you would say? I don't remember anymore. Oh, because yeah, because you said you said what was the one story that you would want to tell? Oh, what's your best? Well, yeah, what's your best story? Yeah, so you didn't ask me that one. Yeah, so so I yeah I I would just one of my favorite quotes about the future is from Don Van Vliet or Captain Beefheart as he was known. So he once said, 50 years from now, you'll wish you'd gone wow." <laughs> which I really like. I like it. I like it. Thanks for coming on today, Rob. My pleasure. Thank- Best of luck. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Cheers. And until next time, go make something happen. Peace. If you want more of Fringe FM, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or go to fringe.fm where you'll find tons of audio and video interviews with leaders in the fields of genetics, cryptocurrency, longevity, AI, space, VR, and much, much more. And you can follow me on Twitter at It's Matt Ward. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a quick review in iTunes to help more people discover Fringe FM.